Yeah, yeah. Um, hi, everyone. And I just wanted to thank Andrew again for uh, the invitation to speak at this symposium with Debbie and Alexandra um, on a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, and I just want to warn everyone that um, as the last speaker, unfortunately, there is some overlap um, between what Debbie has talked about, what Alexandra has talked about, what I've talked about. But um, what is so wonderful about Alexander Gerard's work is that you can look at the same thing and there are so many different opinions and so many different ways of approaching it. So hopefully you'll um, get something else out of it. And I also wanted to tell you that I do not plan on using the fantasy and magic quote <laughs> in my talk. So we can get that over the way. Um, so I've titled the talk, uh, Designing Modern, Collecting Vernacular, The Artistic Process of Alexander Gerard, because for his far-reaching practice as a designer of interiors, furniture, graphics, textiles, and other objects, the two preoccupations coexist. In fact, I think one could not happen without the other. As a modern designer, Gerard's major projects need to be viewed alongside his devotion to collecting folk art. And for this talk, Andrew has asked me to focus on some of his domestic projects and Herman Miller's textiles and objects shop. And again, you've seen this slide, but uh, we'll look at it again because it's so fabulous. Uh, and now this statement will not be new to this audience, um, but alongside George Nelson and Charles and Ray Eames, Alexander Gerard helped shape the vanguard of modern design at Herman Miller, one of the most important American furniture firms. Now, Gerard was not a theorist like Nelson, nor was he an inventor like Eames, but rather I posit that his importance was as an accumulator and as a selector. He assembled the best design ideas from the period, influenced by his whimsical folk art to create a contemporary zeitgeist that found favor among many Americans. Gerard's talent was also found in his ability to design identities through graphics and visual media. For example, in this photograph, as a construction of his, of his own identity for publicity, Gerard chose to situate himself next to the sculptural architecture of the brick fireplace in his Gross Point home. And among works of folk art, which focused with, with, focused, dramatic and, uh, uh, with focused dramatic lighting in this, in this photograph. And this is important because in this period in which affluence was everywhere due to the United States' really strong post-war economic position, Gerard's connection to a pre-industrial past was a curious yet very intentional point of collecting. Gerard's vision of modernism was colored, literally and figuratively, uh, by his and his wife Susan's passionate collecting of indigenous folk art from Latin America and from around the world. The Gerard's collection, and I know you guys know this, but just stop and think about this for one second, of like 106,000 objects, right? And I know many of you have been to Santa Fe before, but you know, minor plug for those that haven't. Again, you've gotta go there to see this wing that hasn't been touched for, it's, 20, it's 2017 now, so over 35 years is just remarkable. And every time I go to see it, I see something new, I see something different, um, and it's just, it's just a remarkable feat. Um, and of course, it's just a tiny selection of, that, of those 106,000 objects, which is the world's largest collection of multicultural folk art that includes dolls, amulets, and textiles, among many other media. And of course, this was donated to the museum in 1978. Now, thinking about his collection in connection with his design work is important because Gerard believed that the handcraft civilization was quickly disappearing. Thus, his devotion to native textiles and multicultural artifacts was an extension of his belief that these remained legitimate forms of contemporary expression. And as I argue alongside other contemporary historians, that handicrafts and the vernacular were part of the scope of modernism during the mid-century. So let's see how these ideas play out in a few of Girard's projects. So one of the most intimate expressions of a designer is the personal domestic dwelling. And as an architect, Gerard exhibited an early propensity for designing interiors, which was enhanced by his penchant for what they called knick-knack collecting and display. Now, while in the Detroit area, and of course we have heard about this from Debbie, um, his house was featured in numerous domestic and, inter and international publications. Interiors Magazine called it, quote, collage architecture, or a unified structure that contained various assembled and disparate parts. House and Home wrote confusions, knickknacks, free forms, junk, driftwood, or toys. All of these 
have consistency only if they are, and again, the operative word here is selected, with consistently good and imaginative good taste. And according to the New York Times, quote, most unexpected is the profusion of highly ornamental accessories. Accordingly, the photographs used to publicize the home were just as important as the text describing it. For house and home, Gerard's good friend Charles Eames, who gets a shout out all the time, uh, photographed many of Gerard's projects, and he chose to portray the Gross Point home with eight photographs. Interestingly, Eames's focus was on Gerard's tools of design, his outdoor collage, and his collection and display of what, he call, of what they called exquisite junk around the house. These are the characteristics that defined Gerard's home, whimsical, folksy, and full of colors, patterns, and textures as a unique entity. Similarly, design historian Pat Kirkham has demonstrated that the designers Charles and Ray Eames practiced functioning decoration, which incorporated carefully arranged groups of varied objects, those of, quote, extra cultural surprise within several interior spaces to produce an aesthetic of plenty with plush furnishings, handcrafted toys, and folk art objects. The Girards resided in the Detroit suburbs until the family moved to Santa Fe in 1953. There, he sought to integrate modern architecture with local culture and traditional materials through the adobe architecture found all over Santa Fe. The Girards were not alone in their infatuation with the area. Mabel Lewin Dodge, Georgia O'Keeffe, and other artists and writers moved to the Southwest to gain what historian Sylvia Spitta has called, quote, clearer vision, artistically, politically, and emotionally. Gerard manipulated parts of a 200-year-old, a 70-year-old, and a more recent adobe structure composed of white plaster walls and floors paved in a dark reddish stone into a complex statement of modernism, which for Gerard, of course, included elements of a southwestern vernacular tradition. Exterior surfaces were plastered and painted in a pink raw, pinkish raw umber to simulate natural adobe. This predilection for native materials, these highly, this uneven, highly textured wall and, 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 the, and the floor surfaces also speaks to Gerard's interest in materiality, which began really quite early in his career. He reclaimed the previous buildings, pillars and beams, as well as the windows, which were few and small, thus uh, preserving the kind of historical memory of this building. London's Architectural Review wrote that Gerard's home was a recent attempt to integrate modern architecture with what they called strongly characterized local conditions, which we can otherwise think about as the vernacular. Beyond the entrance wall was the living room, the heart of the home, a light and airy space with high ceilings and bright white walls. Without doors to separate the rooms, doorways were used as framing devices to view objects in adjoining rooms. Using the same tools as an exhibition designer, and of course we know that Gerard practiced as an exhibition designer as well, he considered sight lines and objects on access through door openings. Further emphasizing his curatorial eye, he illustrated a penchant for displaying objects in a living room storage wall, a Gerard hallmark. Used by Gerard in domestic and contract interiors, storage walls developed from the early 20th century built-in and later modular furnishings into a flexible furniture type, despite its expansive size and immobility. Specialized for location and function, Gerard's storage walls improved upon the mass-produced version that George Nelson introduced to Herman Miller in 1946. Although Nelson may have created a mass-produced version of the storage wall, Gerard suggested how to populate these multiple fields in a really fresh and dynamic way. In the living room storage wall, Gerard created an accessible way to view and interpret objects. Artful arrangements were orchestrated within the, ni within the niches as groups of figures were arranged in a legible manner within the shelves that formed grids, lit by industrially produced dimmers. The storage walls were also given softness and character through the placement of votive candles. Gerard was recognized during the mid-century for his contributions to what he considered the fundamental furniture object of his era, the room divider or the storage wall. In the pages of House Beautiful, in addition to illustrating the many storage apparatus in the Gerard Santa Fe home, the author suggested the reasons for his success. 
Due to Gerard's architectural training, he was able to order these units in a strong geometric fashion with an eye toward, quote, strict organization. And of course, this uh, uh, relates quite directly with, uh, with what Alexandra was saying. Pittsburgh's Alcoa, the aluminum industrial company, commissioned Gerard, among 20 plus other designers, to fashion a new image of aluminum through an innovative design and advertising program called Forecast. Gerard contributed to the agenda with his aluminum room divider, but it was actually never commercially produced. For Gerard, the storage wall functioned to gather objects, to organize the display of a collection, and to arrange the objet d'art in an attractive manner. In fact, in their spare time, the Girards like to, quote, raise and reconstruct the room divider often. Decorating with folk art also obliquely participated in the DIY movement popular during the post-war period, which championed self-improvement and was possible due to increased leisure time in the period. Working with folk art also contributed and really became symbolic of the humanization of modernism, an idea that was pervasive in the period. Aileen Saarinen, one of Gerard's most vocal champions, wrote, quote, the inclusion of such objects in the home, especially as foils for modern interiors and modern mass-produced furniture, has long been part of sophisticated, or what Mr. Lines would call highbrow taste. Alexander Gerard, the architect, for instance, has an almost magic flair for recognizing the beauty in these objects of both fine and folk art. He arranges them on the shelves and storage walls into endlessly fascinating groupings in which both the composition and the sparkle of individual pieces count." End quote. Now, Saarinen's most salient points here include this idea that folk art should be a foil to modern design and that Gerard was an extraordinary arranger due to his sensitivity to color and beauty, both of which contribute to the humanizing of modernism. Gerard believed that most people found modern art and architecture cold, arid, and inhospitable, and that it referenced steel tubes and boxy arrangements. Part of Gerard's and others like the Eames's contribution to the mid-century visual landscape was this softer, more whimsical modern that accommodated folk art, or as Gerard has noted, that these fascinating figures will quote, work and play in the modern way. I just love that. I mean, for his greatest patron, Gerard collaborated with Eero Saarinen, among others, on one of the most definitive statements of mid-century modernism in the Midwest, the Miller House. The Millers were wealthy, discerning clients who desired a modern home in a town of Victorians for a large family that entertained regularly. Gerard's interior design, in consultation with Xenia Miller, characterized the owners as cultured, forward-thinking, but also willing to trust Gerard's vision. After working for many months on the design of the home, in an early March 1954 letter to Gerard, Saarinen informed him that the Millers liked the general scheme of the house, but they had several comments from a recent three-hour meeting. Some of these include Xenia's aversion to the stairs down into the living room, aka the conversation pit, which for those of you that have seen the show, you can experience that um, that apprehension that she had about going down in the living room. Um, they were also, um, they also really didn't care for the use of air conditioning throughout the house. They really wanted it just in the bedrooms and they wanted an open plan uh, kitchen. So all of them met in Santa Fe over a long weekend in March of 1954 to discuss these details among many others. And the Millers provided precise details regarding some areas. And they interrogated Gerard about the highly contentious conversation pit and whether it would be, quote, sufficiently warm and intimate when inhabited by only four or six people. Was the sitting area adequately open to the outdoors? Might the conversation pit feel like a basement? These were all major, major concerns. Further, they were particularly apprehensive about, as I mentioned, about this idea of stepping down into the living room. So as you all can see, the Millers eventually acquiesced and approved the steps to the lower living area with the caveat that the trees be visible to create separation. This extraordinarily complex commission took many years of planning, designing, buying, and assembling. And since I've already mentioned the conversation pit, which was one of the hallmarks of the house, I'll give you a few more details to give you a sense of Gerard's process of design, especially as it relates to his, to his incorporation of folk art. An invoice from April 20th, 1955, demonstrates Gerard's accretive method as he purchased a tie silk from Tybox Silk, which was a shop in New York, 
three years before 1955. So in 1952, he bought this silk and he, and he held on to it. Gerard also acquired three woven cashmere works from New Delhi. Um, and of course, he was traveling to New Delhi for a different project. So this is Gerard, you know, going on a trip, thinking about the 17 different projects that he has going on and making acquisitions for all of them. So these two cashmere works that he bought from New Delhi, he saved those for these pillow covers as well. They were, these particular objects were pretty expensive objects um, at the time. Um, these, the, the, um, Gerard charged the Millers $614, um, which was nearly $4,000 in today's money for these three works. So two pillows um, and one hanging. And so that's just like three out of, I don't know, like 7,000 objects that are in the, that are in the house. Um, of course, some purchases were slightly less costly, um, including a, pillow, uh, a group of pillow fabrics, like this um, Indonesian ikat print um, that's on the screen now that cost $119 in 1955. Um, other interesting fabrics for the pillows were procured from Pan American Shop in New York, including winter pit pillows from Peru. Um, so he retro you can see the, um, his marks on the left here. He retrofitted a saddlebag and turned it into a pillow. Um, and summer pit pillows from Guatemala, which included a huipil, um, which was a hand-woven um, traditional gar garment that was worn by indigenous Mexicans and Central Americans. He balanced these vernacular non-Western textiles with hand-woven fabrics by Jack Leonard Larson and Scalamandra silk fabrics, which added variety in texture, color, and diverse cultural identity. Over the years, Gerard sent the Millers many objects, um, particularly works of folk art for display in their home. And I wanted to share one of Gerard's projects for Herman Miller. Of course, he did so many things for Herman Miller. Um, and on the screen here, I'm showing you, uh, you know, the, the first showroom that he did for San, for San Francisco in 1958. Um, but that's not the project that I want to talk about. Um, while he was working at Herman Miller, um, George Nelson and Charles Eames acknowledged that, that there were um, not enough fabrics for use in American architecture and design projects. And so they encouraged DJ Dupree to hire Alexander Girard to fix this problem. So Girard began his tenure with Herman Miller by coordinating and creating a fabric division for the firm. And this was because he perceived this opportunity in the marketplace and Herman Miller introduced Girard's, Girard designed fabrics alongside its pretty established furniture repertoire um, to really better serve their clients. Gerard's initial collection established a furniture line, quote, on the basis of his training as an architect. So this was really important, right? Um, so, they, so he designed plain upholsteries uh, with geometric drapery prints, stripes, circles, and triangles, all of which had a really specific architectural quality. During Gerard's first year with Herman Miller, one of the press release photographs that you see um, on the screen announced this first new line of wallpaper that exhibits this architectural quality. And you can also see that it also really curiously includes a vernacular object. Uh, retrospective, which is the wallpaper that you see, is a hand-printed wallpaper that's composed of these architectural elements that was what they deemed appropriate at the time for these contemporary settings. But it really formed the background for this mermaid folk art figure, which in my estimation, really intimates Herman Miller's initial foray into a more playful or whimsical approach to selling modern living. Gerard parlayed his previous experiences designing textiles, exhibitions, and retail settings into an idea for an entirely new venture for Herman Miller, textiles and objects, or the TNO shop. This store included an unusual combination of Gerard designed and Gerard sourced fabrics, as well as complementary objects like folk art, to New York City in the early 1960s. Gerard produced dynamic merchandising displays for this highly unconventional Herman Miller experimental shop, which gained critical success, but only remained open to the public for a few short years. It, opening on May 22, 1961, the store displayed Gerard's fabrics and decorative accessories alongside global folk art selected by Gerard to create a veritable exhibition offering an exciting visual experience of color and texture. DJ Dupree noted, quote, the occasion of textiles and objects is a culmination of a 10-year dream of Mr. Gerard and Herman Miller. Alexander and Susan Gerard have put the best of their talented lives into this program. They were the first to see the value of such a showroom, end quote. From Gerard's viewpoint, a textile showroom was crucial to enlarge Herman Miller's fabric business. Further, the additional media coverage regarding Gerard's design, you know, couldn't hurt his reputation. 
In addition to selling fabrics, Gerard developed this idea of an accessories and oddments program for the various showrooms across the country. The purpose of the program would be to one, to build traffic in the showrooms, to two, extend an additional service to their customers, three, to enhance the image of the company, and four, to give a feeling of change and activity in the showroom and a feeling of freshness, which is not usually accomplished by, and this is in their words, our designs, which are rather long-lived. So this is important because this concept of freshness, which is kind of an intangible one, but is an important revelation to aid in the understanding and the outlook at Herman Miller. The comments about in image enhancement are clear, right? Every American business desires to set itself apart from others. But the remarks on freshness implied George Nelson's recent musings on this American predilection for, quote, Kleenex culture. Accessories and oddments would give these consumers the ability to change their interior with just a few small alterations. Items um, uh, to be decided for the new program were purchased by were to be purchased by Nelson, Gerard, and Eames for sale in the showroom. And according to Max Dupree, quote, this program is not charged with the responsibility to make a profit or to build a volume of sales. It is to provide a growing and continuing fund so that the program itself can continue to grow and thereby more adequately carry out the purpose, end quote. So fundamentally, this accessories program and the TNO shop, by extension, were important for brand enhancement. As an example of the program, the shop featured ceramics made by his brother Tunsi in Italy, um, and these wonderful cloth dolls that were made by Marilyn Newhart of Los Angeles and sold exclusively in the period by TNO. Gerard was introduced by Newhart to Newhart's dolls um, when she be began to make them in the late 1950s, um, and actually Ray Eames was the one who told Gerard about the Newhart dolls. You can see them here displayed prominently in the shop's front window, um, and I think Newhart's dolls were a really inspired choice of contemporary craft to advertise the store. The floor-to-ceiling glass wall of the TNO storefront revealed a brightly lit jewel box interior to passers-by on East 53rd Street. The interior was deep and narrow, which allowed Gerard to hang fabric panels from the ceiling to disrupt the space and to create vignettes. All the surfaces, the walls, the ceiling, and the floor were white to form this non-competitive canvas for the fabrics and the objects. And unlike previous Herman Miller showrooms, which were laid out in room settings, Textiles and objects were displayed in vignettes without a hierarchy in the showroom. And I think this really echoes Gerard's viewpoint on folk art, that there's no, that there's no hierarchy. Following German architectural theorist Gottfried Semper, who believed that architecture evolved from handicrafts, architectural ornament was not simply decoration. It formed a symbolic language that embodied the visual expression of a building. So we can read the surfaces and ornamentation of Gerard's textiles as important in articulating the message of the space. Built-in fe built display features, fixtures were employed throughout the shop, including low stools and shelving visible in the front window display. Designed by Gerard, the display tower was constructed of chrome-plated steel with white cellulosic coated aluminum rods that supported shelves with integrated lighting. Lining the walls of the store were storage cupboards, which Gerard faced with panels of his own designed fabrics, and he also designed a white counter containing fabric samples, the reception desk, and the display easels, all of which were manufactured by Herman Miller. As a viewpoint, rather as a focal point for the front of the store, the sofa was upholstered in these bright solid colors and was a curious, although not completely unknown use of an antique within the confines of a modern store. Contemporary retailing guides noted the preference for neutral monochromatic interiors within modern stores, but psychologists in the period contended that people were starved for color. And historian Regina Blaschik has shown that most Americans were what she's called chromophobic until the post-war era, when colorists were employed in advertising, architecture, merchandising, and product, um, product design to combat this predisposition. Gerard responded to this call by tapping into the psychological need to experience color. Beyond injecting the interior with another colorful tableau, this tri-lobed sofa may have served a further function. Gerard was no stranger in utilizing antique furniture. For example, he included it in, the, in Detroit's For Modern Living exhibition. 
This Victorian style sofa may have surreptitiously appealed to atypical customers for Herman Miller, suggesting that even those Americans with antique furnishings could have participated in the modern mixing of fashion forward textiles with global folk art and their own antiques at home. Luxury retailer and fellow collector, uh, Stanley Marcus of Neiman Marcus, claimed that Girard was the first to incorporate folk art into interiors and that he made folk art more accessible to a wide public through exhibitions and various corporate commissions. While the latter part of that statement might be true, I don't think that Girard was the first, um, but he may have been the one to most publicly proclaim folk art as fashionable for decorating post-war modern interiors. Girard defied a modern architecture that dictated that only essentials should be incorporated. Instead of an uncluttered and pristine setting, Girard created an environment of contrast in which native objects collected from around the world were positioned for contemplation and amusement. He thought, quote, we should preserve evidence of the past, not as a pattern for sentimental imitation, but as nourishment of the creative spirit of the present. In Girard's work, these two contrasting trajectories, folk art and modern design, are inseparable. For Girard, his contributions to modern design would not have been possible without the collecting of indigenous folk art. As a corollary, the reception of post-war modern architecture flourished, that is, the kind that attracted international attention, like that of the Eames Case Study House, through photographs displaying the softening properties of folk art and other extra-cultural surprises. Interestingly, Although the indigenous folk art that Girard collected was often viewed as primitive or vernacular and fundamentally rooted in the past, I believe that he would have viewed them as markers of modernity. He made assembling folk art part of his artistic practice, and for him, they were more than just souvenirs. For Girard, these objects were full of value for their, their design value, their storytelling value, and for keeping culture alive. Folk art afforded a way to remain relevant within mainstream modernism by doing something different. In post-war America, everyone understood that when Girard was involved in a project, that the product or the end result was going to be a highly colorful, distinctive, modern, and full of folk art. All of these were part of Girard's larger accumulative vision as he designed modern and collected vernacular. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Uh, I'd like to invite the speakers up front um, to the chairs, and we'll continue. We'll turn on these, and Mike will turn on those. <laughs> and we'll uh, have uh, questions, and I'd like to prioritize your questions in particular, but I th think we'd like to start off with one question in particular, so we'll let Mike. We're good? No. <laughs> So I think the, the one question that I get asked a lot, um, so I thought I'd, I'd entertain your answers, <laughs> is um, why Gerard today? Like why do we, because you know, there's a theory that you know, of course he was very relevant at his own time. He kind of recedes from history, from historical consciousness, and now we can celebrate him, we can see him in a new light. Um, why do we think that is happening today? Like, what is what is this relevance? What is this connection? What is the what's resonating today about this work that's now you know decades old? <laughs> I mean, I, I have I have a thought. Um, it's we, we probably all have different answers to this, but um, if I lean back, can you can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, great. Okay, so um, I actually think that we're living in a moment now that is really similar to that of the post-war period, right? Um, and I think about the post-war period as one of um, kind of real anxiety, um, and that this kind of, <laughs> here, right? I mean, just think about it. Um, politically, culturally, I mean, you, you know, you can, you can go in whatever direction you want, but it is kind of similar to what, um, to what they were to what they were dealing with, and so um, design in this in this designing colorfully um, and with purpose and with a kind of purpose about teaching humanity, right? Because if we think about the way that Gerard utilized his folk art, um, that 
this was um, a way of kind of bringing people together. Um, so I think it actually resonates on a really like, um, on a humanitarian level, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'd say, I guess I have two, I have two theories. Um, the first one is I think we're living through an era where um, interior design as, as a profession and as a, like sort of an important thing to look at is ever more present in our minds, mm -hmm. um, partially through the magic of social media. Um, so I just I want to show one personal anecdote. Like sometimes I write about the interiors that I grew up with, which mm -hmm. is actually both sets of my grandparents collected modern design. And I have often asked my mother, oh, do you think we have a photo of that? Like, is there any record of that lamp? And the last time I asked her, she sent me back this very tart email that said, you know, back then we didn't take pictures of our bedside tables all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like Gerard's work is perfect for the Instagram era where we, like everybody's thinking about vignettes and like everybody's curating yeah. their shelves and like, this is no longer something that's seen as sort of subservient or secondary to architecture, and it's something that like lots of people want to participate in. And so Gerard is a genius of the form, yeah. and so like we can all learn things for our everyday lives from him. Yeah, we were talking about that because we're shocked at the absence of photographs of so many key things you know that we wish that they had taken photographs and they didn't think to take photographs of them so I think that's interesting he would be very interested I'm sure to see how many people are sharing all of his designs today <laughs> but so as many. much as we are in a period of anxiety today I do think especially in Detroit like living in Detroit now in this kind of in this era I think we are at a similar kind of a time period where there is a lot of anxiety but there's also a lot of optimism mm -hmm. for the future so I do see kind of a similarity to kind of you know that that time period in the post-war now. I, I also think that contemporary designers today and I can't think of what that New York Times article was a few weeks ago that had the it was like the designers that are doing blobby things and in like in like uh, rich colors that like that's the design that that is what people are designing right now and so there is a real connection between this is that the aesthetic of Gerard and what designers are doing today yeah I feel like we went through a kind of a neo minimalist period where everything was very like gray and white and clean and now and and there's always you know it's like every reaction has a e equal and opposite counter reaction and so Gerard like going for Gerard is like, okay, you know what? Like, I can't look at another, like, house with a white floor and a gray sofa. Like, I now, you know, like, I and, need and, color. Gray, and gray books. Like, I need colors. I'm gonna, you know, like, organize my books by color. I'm gonna put things on the shelves. It's like, like, something needs to kind of, like, come back and enrich that environment. And mm -hmm. that is, again, like, ex like, what his philosophy was, this kind of, like, enrichment and layering and like not being afraid of color, but also like not being afraid of having like Japanese paper with a Mexican kachina doll and Didn't like matter. a Thai silk. Like those things go together. Like yep. if his eyes said they go together. And just the functional aspect of that too. I mean, if you look at the McLucas house, this amount, sheer amount of storage, I mean, was ahead of its time. And I mean, you know, people, a lot of people look at these magazines of these beautiful modern homes and you know where's all their stuff do they not have stuff or is it all hidden they have tons of stuff <laughs> everyone has stuff right and that's okay you know so um, you just need a place to put it uh -huh. so they have a storage unit yes <laughs> yeah. I don't know of them not accepting anything. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm s I haven't actually done that much like research on that, but I mean, if you've seen the photos upstairs and like the whole, I mean, because the whole like Granite's advertising was the end of the plain plain, mm. it's hard to imagine like yeah. what what could have um, what could have been too much given yeah. that environment. So, so, so that pro that project, um, the end of the plain plain, is Mary Wells's tagline, and Mary brought um, Gerard in because Mary had seen La Fonda del Sol, and she was like. I need to I need to rebrand Braniff in order to, and Braniff is you know we want them to go to Latin America more more regularly, and she had seen La Fonda del Sol in New York and was was so taken by what Gerard had done there, which was to talk about identity, right? I mean he had done the entire thing, um, menus to I mean, he didn't do the he didn't do the the costumes there, but um, so look I I have looked through some of the things in the archives for Braniff Airlines and I'm pretty. I, and I, I could be wrong, but um, everything that I've seen that has been that was in his archive for Braniff was turned into something. Um, but that doesn't mean that he didn't destroy things that didn't make it. Um, so I think it's it's hard to say uh, whether things were shot down or not because a designer's archive they don't t typically keep rejects. But actually, um, uh, uh, there are a few articles, and I'm, and I'm blanking on when it was written, but he, um, Gerard, uh, there, it was like House and Garden or one of the magazines, and um, Gerard offered ways for like the housewife to be able to um, populate, and uh, to populate um, her storage wall at home. So he was very much about like disseminating this information and not necessarily having the like hero designer be the one to put the stuff in the in the spaces it was really a, it was really a way for everyone to participate in this movement so I actually I'm not sh I'm not sure that it was so um, heroic um, and that like everyone needed to hire him to be able to do this I think he wanted people to do it on their own yeah I I think I see his organizational practice as more reifying the object, like not reifying like his mm -hmm. organization mm -hmm. of the object, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like I think, I mean obviously like he went to markets and he went to these places and he, he selected things that he thought were the best things. But then I think his design is almost a support to show other people how beautiful these things from many cultures are. I mean, yes, there's a curation and a selection, um, but I I don't I guess I don't see I don't see it as as a flattening project or as as kind of making them his own. I, I see it more as as like a presentation. Yeah, there was a moment in the conception for the DIA exhibition where they did actually have a proposal called the Victorian Room, mm -hmm. and they kind of set the Victorian you know style up as almost kind of like a straw man, like you know. You could yeah. be like this, or you could do this new thing. And the DIA director Richardson actually said, you know, let's not do that. Let's let's take that part out of it. You know, although they still have well, that's the what that first room yeah. is. Yeah, they where still, you choose yeah. this or the other. Yeah, yeah, so they still included it, but it was going to be actually kind of the concept for it. Yeah, it's comp I think it's complicated what you're <laughs> suggesting because the historical moments are are, are, are are slightly different. Like even within what we call the vernacular, or like you know outside. So that carries a certain, um, a, a certain time frame for me. That because what he was looking at, what he found was, you know, when you look upstairs in the objects, there's certain typologies, and he was really interested in people hand making, for example, their own toys. Mm -hmm. 
And he would probably juxtapose that against industrial production of toys to purchase, you know, like you would make your own artifacts instead of just buying them from the store. So I think he was having that kind of dialogue, you know, in and against modernism itself rather than um, a kind of colonialist enterprise. Now, he, he did go global, and I think he found connections. So he would, I, in my opinion, he was looking at the difference within each culture, but then when he brought all of that together, it was under a fairly universal humanist Mm -hmm. which we can now see in you know, retrospect. There is a certain leveling there, but it's a kind of leveling that happens, I think, uh, through connections, through, through looking at similarity mm -hmm. between things and between cultures. And he, he definitely was part of that grand enterprise of his century that tried to create a commonality of, of, the, of, of all, human, <laughs> all humankind, mm -hmm. basically. But it's, yeah, it's interesting. That's a great point. And also, we don't know what his journey was like in his partner. And it's like going to these places and the intimate relationships that he established with these people, going to their villages and, you know, going into these maybe dark places or, you know, hidden, hidden places, magical places, and seeing all these beautiful toys, all these beautiful objects that were handmade and seeing the process and being so enchanted There, there are a few instances um, where Gerard went back to the same places, um, and uh, there are um, notes that he would go and visit some, some of the same potters, for example. Um, and so that's really nice, again, to, to, since we're talking about like, you know, this kind of humanity, um, that, uh, that, that's an, that that's an example of, um, you know, we can kind of more, almost extrapolate a story around that, right? Where like, he buys something, he really likes it, it works, in some, in, it works and he continues to go back and has this relationship with this, with this craftsperson. Um, and that's, I think, a really nice, um, a really nice way of thinking about uh, his, his purchasing practice and also his, his artistic practice. who has remarked on that. Um, I, I've never found any reference to him consulting on Disney, but the artist for It's a Small World is this mm -hmm. um, like wonderful, wonderfully talented painter called Mary Blair, um, who did the like sort of background art for Alice in Wonderland and a number of the Disney films. And she has a style that is very similar to Gerard. And if you've ever been to the Walt Disney Family Museum in the Presidio in San Francisco, they have this terrazzo floor that has motifs taken from Mary Blair art that are like hearts and flowers and suns in like the same hot colors that Gerard <laughs> used. So I guess I don't I don't know if there's a direct connection, but I, I guess I just feel like those two artists who were working at the same time happened to have very similar, like authentic styles. Um, but yeah, no, I've, I've, I've seen so many photos of It's a Small World and I understand that it's like hard to believe it came yeah. from a different <laughs> hand. <laughs> so, yeah.
would need so many assistants, right? I mean, like, look at the show. That's a fraction. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fifth. So you're superhuman, right? So, um, so they would, he would have to employ assistants, but they only worked um, for certain hours of the day. And then he would keep working. And so when they reappeared the next day, there would be uh, multitudes more sketches, more designs. So he was in constant production mode, but needing the help of all of the people to execute a variety of different things. When you think about the different fields that he was practicing in textiles, mm -hmm. interiors, especially interiors, um, architecture, graphic design, and identity systems, branding, all of that stuff required. He was fabricating a lot of things mm -hmm. and also refabricating some things that he found uh, for other clients. Like his, most of those were one of kind objects that were designed or made. Yeah. And one of the things that I um, started to get into but, but didn't have time to was um, the role of Susan in his, yes. um, in his practice. And you know, he wouldn't have been, he would have been, he would not have been as successful as he was without her because she managed so much of the of the office from like writing letters and we've all read letters from you know letters written by Susan while Gerard's on one of his trips or he's too busy to do this um, so she really uh, did a lot of managing for him and I, I suspect some design work as well just based on things. Yeah Marshall his son their son actually commented there would not have been an Alexander Gerard without Susan Gerard yeah. and I think that is definitely a subject that needs to be mm -hmm. investigated more. Yeah her role her, in her in her taste and her yep. yeah. <laughs> the family also mentioned uh, the father of the fifth. He was a Mediterranean and had mm -hmm. collections. His author was and a brother, and both the brother and Alexander Gerard were passionate about inventory and documents. <laughs> yes. What about the brother? Did he have any uh, clue at all, or did he know anything about S that? So. So I only briefly mentioned Tunsi in the TNO shop, but Tunsi was a ceramic artist, um, and uh, so Gerard sold t some of Tunsi's work at TNO. There's some of Tunsi's work at the Miller House. There's, I mean, he he acted as like Tunsi's broker in the United States, I think. Because <laughs> Tunsi lived in, in Florence. In Florence, yeah. So that's like the the Italian branch of the family. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, I, looking at that, there was, I mentioned just a few of the books about kind of American roadside architecture from that period, but there, there is this period of like five to 10 years where there are even more publications about it. Like it suddenly became this kind of like topic of discussion. Like our, you know, our, our nation has become so ugly because of the car yeah, and all of that. Visual pollution. Right, right. And, and, um, you know, like, and I think, I guess different people dealt with it in different ways. And so it's like the Venturis were the first to say, no, it's great. And as, as I was saying, I don't think that, Ger like Gerard couldn't go that far. Like he couldn't, he could embrace like Victorian architecture and gingerbread, but he couldn't embrace that like pure commercial culture of the day. So um, it's, it's, it's like each, each of these architects has their own like cutoff point for kind of like what they can deal with <laughs> and what they can't. <laughs> and so I think he, his idea, I mean like many people, like he was worried, I mean the Washington Street project was partially because they were worried that the center of their town would be kind of hollowed out by malls being built on the edge of town. So by, by Gerard providing this kind of ephemeral architecture for it, they thought that it could then, they would compete better with the balls being built by people like Victor mm -hmm. Gruen. So he was trying through design to kind of tie together the, the old world um, in, a, in a more cohesive way 
to allow it to compete with the new world. Um, right. But I don't, but yeah, he wasn't ready to say that the new world was also okay. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, it's like, you think if, if he kept practicing longer, would part of the new world also have been incorporated? Like, I, I mean, I've never seen any of his work that like actually had, you know, neon, like he did integrated lighting at right. TNO, which is and in a few other places. Right, right, which is maybe a little more disco in a way, <laughs> but but like real real 70s, real postmodernism, I don't think so. I mean, I think now some of his work can look that way, but I, I don't, don't think that was his intellectual background or mm -hmm. intention. No, it seems like there's a, there's a mechanism for ordering, arranging, ordering, selecting, right, all the, the modernist, modernist tropes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's a, but the funny, the funny yeah. part is like looking at your slide, that the Venturis then employ that mentally to yes. make order out of the chaos of Las Vegas, which right. is they're actually enacting a kind of modernist script in their own yeah. house. So some license. of the designs are being reissued and through Maharam. Um, Maharam's now a, a subset of Herman Miller, so they're a fabric a textile company, so you can buy. Um, in the exhibition, the large draping fabrics are reissues of um, uh, Gerard's fabric designs by Maharam. So, so some of them are available, and then some of the patterns get reissued through the family, the estate. Um, they authorize third parties to uh, reproduce some of those designs, maybe not Maharam, M-A-H-A-R-A-M. <laughs> Did I spell that right? Um, One yeah. of your sponsors. It's, it's a, <laughs> not visually in my head. Um, they're, they're, a modern, uh, they're a modern textile uh, design uh, manufacturing company. Um, a very good one, uh, very high quality, um, and, and very much interested in, in reissuing modern um, designs. Oh. <laughs> well, I always thought, you know, when I started working on, on this project, I actually thought that it was perhaps this oppressive, you know, very ultra-traditional atmosphere in Gross Point that was, you know, was kind of anathema to modernism, and it turns out that that wasn't. It actually, I think he, uh, there was a comment at one point that, you know, he just needed to be able to have some, to get away, to be able to have some time to, to work. You know, he had just accepted this position at Herman Miller, and he actually had a lot of projects going on in Gross Point and in, you know, the kind of the mid-century period. So actually with like too many things going on, that's what was surprising me. Yeah. He, he talks about loving the quality of light in the Southwest. I mean, what, what, we can't always trust what someone says, you know, like 30 years later, um, but uh, certainly traveling, um, the amount of traveling that they that they that they did, um, and and kind of seeing that part of the country, they fell in love with it, um, and also understanding that the Eames office in California was able to work successfully with Herman Miller. That like, why not? Yeah, and that the distance is not a problem for, for that relationship. So um, it was, you know, in terms of like a in terms of a business relationship, it was okay. But I think it was more for, you know, as Debbie was saying, more for um, his his kind of artistry. And there were advantages. I always see it a little bit as, I mean, Gerard by all accounts was a very modest man and he did not seek or self-promote mm -hmm. in the same way as people like the Eameses, which is I think you know, why it's taken longer for his work to be recognized. And I always see his move to Santa Fe as him saying, you know, the, the clients will come to me. You know? <laughs> like, like he didn't need to be at the center of it all. Like he didn't need to be in New York. He didn't yeah. need to be in Detroit. Like, I have enough work, like I want to do it my way, and like in Santa Fe, I can do it my way. I think as you mentioned too, that Santa Fe was holding a certain sort of esteem yeah. and character at that time for, for this idea of getting away, but also the Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
Hi, everyone. And I just wanted to thank Andrew again for uh, the invitation to speak at this symposium with Debbie and Alexandra um, on a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, and I just want to warn everyone that um, as the last speaker, unfortunately, there is some overlap um, between what Debbie has talked about, what Alexandra has talked about, what I've talked about. But um, what is so wonderful about Alexander Gerard's work is that you can look at the same thing and there are so many different opinions and so many different ways of approaching it. So hopefully you'll um, get something else out of it. And I also wanted to tell you that I do not plan on using the fantasy and magic quote in my talk. So we can get that over the way. Um, so I've titled the talk, uh, Designing Modern, Collecting Vernacular, The Artistic Process of Alexander Gerard because for his far-reaching practice as a designer of interiors, furniture, graphics, textiles, and other objects, the two preoccupations coexist. In fact, I think one could not happen without the other. As a modern designer, Gerard's major projects need to be viewed alongside his devotion to collecting folk art. And for this talk, Andrew has asked me to focus on some of his domestic projects and Herman Miller's textiles and objects shop. And again, you've seen this slide, but uh, we'll look at it again because it's so fabulous. Uh, and now this statement will not be new to this audience, um, but alongside George Nelson and Charles and Ray Eames, Alexander Gerard helped shape the vanguard of modern design at Herman Miller, one of the most important American furniture firms. Now, Gerard was not a theorist like Nelson, nor was he an inventor like Eames, but rather I posit that his importance was as an accumulator and as a selector. He assembled the best design ideas from the period, influenced by his whimsical folk art to create a contemporary zeitgeist that found favor among many Americans. Gerard's talent was also found in his ability to design identities through graphics and visual media. For example, in this photograph, as a construction of his, of his own identity for publicity, Gerard chose to situate himself next to the sculptural architecture of the brick fireplace in his Grosse Point home. And among works of folk art, which focused with, with focused dramatic and uh, uh, with focused dramatic lighting in this, in this photograph. And this is important because in this period in which affluence was everywhere due to the United States' really strong post-war economic position, Gerard's connection to a pre-industrial past was a curious yet very intentional point of collecting. Gerard's vision of modernism was colored, literally and figuratively, uh, by his and his wife Susan's passionate collecting of indigenous folk art from Latin America and from around the world. The Gerard's collection, and I know you guys know this, but just stop and think about this for one second, of like 106,000 objects, right? And I know many of you have been to Santa Fe before, but you know, minor plug for those that haven't. Again, you've got to go there to see this wing that hasn't been touched for, it's, 20, it's 2017 now, so over 35 years is just remarkable. And every time I go to see it, I see something new, I see something different, um, and it's just, it's just a remarkable feat. Um, and of course, it's just a tiny selection of, that, of those 106,000 objects which is the world's largest collection of multicultural folk art that includes dolls, amulets, and textiles, among many other media. And of course, this was donated to the museum in 1978. Now, thinking about his collection in connection with his design work is important because Gerard believed that the handcraft civilization was quickly disappearing. Thus, his devotion to native textiles and multicultural artifacts was an extension of his belief that these remained legitimate forms of, con 